If everyone could take their seats, we're going to get started in a moment. All right, I'd like to welcome everyone in the audience and everyone watching via the live stream. My name is Zach Whiting. I am the Senior Fellow of Technology Policy here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And I will be spearheading TPPF's technology policy initiatives, uh, which will hopefully help position TPPF in Texas uh, as leaders in a bold, conservative, state-based approach to technological innovation and policy. This is our first technology policy primer, and I look forward to many more in the future. Today, we have a two-for-one primer. We are joined by two eminent technology policy experts who will discuss two different but very important and timely issues. Our first speaker is FCC Commissioner Nathan Symington, who will speak on space policy. And I did a little research on this, and while outer space is generally viewed as the area 62 miles above the Earth's surface, what happens in space has profound impacts on what happens here on Earth. Satellites in orbit have applications in telecommunications, the internet, weather, navigation, imagery, and beyond. And while Texas is home to the famous Johnson Space Center, Texas is becoming a leader in the private space industry. Our second professor, our second speaker is law professor Adam Candu, who will speak on state-based approaches to regulating big tech. There are many discussions out there on topics like Section 230 and antitrust, but I think the states, especially Texas, have an important role in safeguarding the health, safety, welfare, and morals of their citizens. Professor Kandub has thought deeply and written and spoken widely on the consumer protection approaches states can consider in regulating big tech. I will first introduce Commissioner Symington, ask him to speak with us, and then I will introduce Professor Kandub. Nathan Symington was nominated to serve as a commissioner of the FCC by President Donald J. Trump. He was confirmed by the United States Senate in 2020. Commissioner Symington brings both private and public sector experience to the commission. Previously, he served as a senior advisor at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA. In this role, he worked on many aspects of telecommunications policy, including spectrum allocation and planning, broadband access, and the US government's role in the internet. Commissioner Symington is a graduate of the University of Michigan Law School, and I hope there's no bad blood between you and your choice of law school. Uh, Commissioner Symington grew up in Saskatchewan, Canada. He became a United States citizen and now lives in McLean, Virginia. And as I mentioned to the commissioner earlier, if we have one thing in common, it's that my wife and I used to live in McLean, Virginia, and our son was born just outside in Falls Church. So it always holds a special place in my heart. I would ask all of you to please help welcome Commissioner Nathan Symington. Thanks very much for that kind introduction, and it's a real pleasure to get the chance to speak to you today. I'm going to speak today about the topic of orbital debris, so the collection of junk, both natural and artificial, that orbits our planet. It moves pretty fast, too, about 17,000 miles per second, more, uh, sorry, miles per hour, more or less. And for perspective, if you have a marble moving at that speed, it would blow up your car. Orbital debris presents a real and present danger to all commercial activity in space, and we should do what we can to reduce potential harms uh, coming from orbital debris in order to maintain a vibrant space economy into the long term. But as we do this, we should also take a fresh look at past and present risks, and we should give credit for approaches that are low risk, not just panic and increase regulatory burden because debris is in the news. Both the private sector and regulators have a role to play here, and today I want to be clear about what the FCC's regulatory role can and I think should be. So the speech and parts can be a bit technical, but happy to address any lingering questions afterward. What's more, orbital debris could never have been more timely. And I, plan, I, I promise you I didn't plan this, but a few hours ago, a four-ton piece of a Chinese rocket booster created an approximately 65-foot crater as it slammed into the surface of the moon at around 5,800 miles per hour. This is the first known example of a piece of space junk colliding with something in outer space well beyond typical orbital height. But this ought to worry us, especially because we don't want the sector as a whole to get blamed, to get tarred with the brush of this irresponsibility. So don't get me wrong. I don't think that this by itself proves that we actually need more regulation. It's more that we need a fresh look 
at the question of orbital debris, and we need to tailor our debris policy to current realities. Also in the news, last Saturday, Elon Musk announced that Starlink was live in Ukraine with additional terminals en route. It's hard to confirm reports of Starlink usage in Ukraine because of the fog of war, but I've got no reason to think that the effort failed. And I think there are lessons to be learned both in Ukraine's ask and in Starlink's response. In times of conflict, disruptions to internet connectivity, especially in rural regions, are an unprecedented type of infrastructure risk. America is increasingly moving vital services from public safety to logistics to industrial production onto internet-based technologies. And we're not alone in this. Disruptions to these can instantly place whole regions, even whole countries, on the wrong side of the digital divide despite years of effort to get on the right side. Questions of continuity and stability are more pointed every day as we become more dependent. Internationally, it's not just about Ukraine. Cutting off access to communications infrastructure is a tactic used to devastating effect in kinetic conflicts, cyber warfare, and government suppression of unrest. The Northern Tigray region of Ethiopia, Myanmar, Kazakhstan, I could go on, have all experienced targeted communications disruptions in recent years. Indeed, the widespread use of Twitter during the Arab Spring protests over a decade ago demonstrated the vital role that internet communication was already playing in world affairs. Small wonder then that a decade later, disruption to communications is central in both interstate conflicts and intrastate suppression. The little guy might not have much, but typically these days he has a phone. But this isn't just about the little guy in far off countries either. Emergency and disaster response over here must also think hard about robustness and redundancy as our vital services increasingly depend on always on high speed, high reliability internet. So we ask how satellite internet impacts the situation. We in this room are by now habituated to thinking about satellite internet as a supplement or as a cure for poor rural connectivity. And of course it may well be, but we also have to think about what it can become. For one thing, it could be the common man's iridium. Think about it. World governments rely on satellite connections to go where other forms of communication cannot and to work when other forms of communication don't. But if someone in a region in conflict has a high speed consumer internet ground terminal and a satellite pointed at it, that might work just the same. And of course, the same reasoning applies over here in the aftermath of a hurricane, earthquake, or blizzard. Other advances in connectivity are proposed by companies that, pro that promise to provide satellite backup for ordinary consumer grade cell phones when, where there's no terrestrial connectivity. And I, I don't know about you, but I find it pretty appealing, the idea that an iPhone can turn into a sat phone that easily. And given all this, disrupting connectivity just isn't as easy as it used to be. The signal has to be jammed, the terminal has to be destroyed, or a ground station, potentially a continent away, must be hacked or otherwise disrupted. That defense might not be perfect, but it sure contrasts with the alternative, where a bad actor might need only a pair of pliers, or a hurricane might just need to knock over some poles. Redundant capabilities are suddenly available just as they're most needed. I'm not sure if the high-speed consumer internet satellite companies were thinking about security of ordinary people as a use case when they started development, but as with so many new uses for technology, new capabilities have created new possibilities. Starlink's speed in responding to the Ukrainian request also drew attention. Ukraine's Vice Prime Minister Mikhailo Fedorov added Elon Musk on Twitter for help. Twelve hours later, Musk announced that Starlink was live in Ukraine. The speed with which Starlink was able to respond to this request relates not only to you know, what I'm sure are extraordinary internal controls, but to the very nature of the service itself. With the best will in the world, you couldn't have done it without the technical cap capacities that had been built up to that point. Um, this has larger implications for capacities of the sector taken as a whole. Satellites can change where they're pointing a lot faster than new cable can be laid. And so I couldn't be more proud of the leadership of American industry in the emerging space economy. But that leadership does not belong to us ineluctably or by right. It's the consequence of actions that we've taken, of excellence that we've achieved by enormous effort. And if we're to maintain leadership, it will be because of actions that we take now and efforts lying in the future. And if I may, more than just American leadership in the space economy is at stake. Failure to act may imperil the existence of the very space economy itself and our prospects as a spacefaring civilization. Congresswoman McMorris Rogers and Congressman Pallone recently jointly introduced bipartisan draft legislation seeking to promote competition, innovation, national security, and American leadership in the commercial satellite communications industries. They proposed two things. First, a word is spared for the development of orbital debris rules at the FCC. I'm going to focus on that piece in a moment. Second, it provides a process for streamlining the processing of NGSO space station licensing, uh, which I think is probably music to the ears of many here while at the same time applying a set of public interest criteria to those streamlined applications. Minor quibbles with language aside, 
Naturally, as a regulator at an independent agency, I prefer to see broad brush uh, authorizing statutes, whereas this one is filled with specific expert drafting. But nonetheless, I respectfully and with due deference would applaud Congress adopting the act with due speed. Why? Well, to take the matter in reverse order, can it be doubted that the United States would be benefited by faster application processing? I don't see it. That's the principal complaint that we receive from satellite service companies, from established players to new entrants. It isn't close. It's a familiar story. Hey, we haven't heard about our application for several months. We're just trying to fly a CubeSat. What gives? Now, let me be clear. This bill needs to be funded. Dedicated and expert FCC staff in the International Bureau are working as fast as they can to clear the decks, and they need help. The growth of the space industry means that we need a growth in licensing capability. We won't be able to achieve the objectives of the bill without staffing up. Relevant sidebar, on a headcount basis, the NTIA, my old agency, and the agency of which uh, Professor Candy used to be the head, is about to be responsible for the administration of broadband infrastructure subsidies in the amount of you know, tens of millions per staffer. We thought we were shorthanded at the FCC. Anyway, if we're given the tools to succeed, the FCC can. The bill offers a more efficient, more responsive, and fairer application process, so it deserves support. And unless my, I miss my guess, it will enjoy very broad support across the commercial space sector. If there are concerns, we can hash them out through the FCC's notice and comment process, which should proceed with the urgency that this question warrants. We want fairness for all players, and if the bill is passed, I'll be happy to work with my colleagues to make sure that we achieve this fairness and efficiency. Some in Congress and elsewhere have expressed some opposition to the bill. Now, not that is about the streamlining of applications, at least not specifically. That would be pretty surprising. But after all, satellites must be licensed to access the US market, and the licensure process must be more than a rubber stamp. No, the refrain is that the US already has onerous launch and satellite regulations, and we don't need more. I take that criticism very much to heart. American rules should promote safety, but we can't just do that and say that we, we finished. We should be thinking about ways to make our rules add value to the sector so that American registration becomes a clear plus, a desirable standard for companies to reach for. Um, if we make it hard for the good guys to launch satellites, I think that we failed. Our job in regulating the sector is not to suppress it. So that leads me to the first part of the bill and what I really want to focus on in detail today, orbital debris. Arguments against the FCC's regulation of orbital debris mitigation uh, standards come in typically in three buckets. Obviously, I'm going to have to paint with a broad brush for simplicity. One, the market's going to figure it out. Just like a hill arises from the intrinsic nature of an ant, orbital debris best practices sufficient to operators and the public will simply emerge from the interactions and incentives of launch and satellite companies. Two, onerous orbital debris regulations will push satellite operators and launch companies out of the United States and into other jurisdictions. If you can launch from Lesotho and deorbit into Denmark, why would anyone come to the United States to be interrogated for a year over the lobes of their antennas? Third, even if orbital debris regs are appropriate, the FCC simply lacks competent authority to implement them. At most, it ought to incorporate standards developed elsewhere, ideally from an independent expert agency like NASA or an international uh, organization, rather than a domestic executive body with a domestic executive agenda. I'm going to take these, these uh, families of complaints and criticisms seriously and address each one in turn. First, it's responsible to hypothesize, it's reasonable, sorry, to hypothesize that the market is going to figure out the orbital debris question for itself. Well, let's consider the real world example of conjunction events. On the government side, our own military warns China when Chinese cre created debris may conjoin with Chinese satellites. Why? Well, when a bolt going Mark 22 hits your visual imaging satellite, it doesn't much matter if the threads are metric or unified national, does it? We already see voluntary bilateral action in this area in the, in the state sector, so that's a data point. And similarly, for commercial operator conjunction events, satellite operators have already developed a unified software platform enjoying universal adoption of standard modeling, automatic messaging, and rapid actioning for conjunction events. That's pretty impressive. But on the other hand, a lot of conjunction events are still being handled by email correspondence. Sometimes the counterparties don't answer on the weekends. There are incommensurable approaches to conjunction modeling. No, no surprise there. Each engineering team is going to have its own perspective on the issue. But perhaps most seriously, it's often even usually unclear which operator bears the maneuvering burden and what exactly that burden is. So despite advances in the private sector, I still think that there's a role for the state to play. It doesn't prove that there's no market solution. After all, it's a new market and the market needs time to act. But what if we don't have time to act? Or what if the most efficient solution is simply coordination at the regulatory level with respect for the private solutions that are already out there? The rate of satellite launches is exploding. It shows no sign of slowing. 
More and more mega constellations are being licensed, some with actual plans for development and launch. How long will it take before orbits of various types reach their carrying capacities? Shouldn't we have some idea what the applicable capacity is before we either approve or deny someone's application on that basis? We do things like this all the time in other industries. And here, we may need to leapfrog a purely market-based, purely iterative process if circumstances dictate. Just to say a word about the LEO sector in particular, my sense is that LEO companies, which are generally much newer companies, feel, um, feel that debris regulation is targeting them. And I understand that because it's easy for a regulatory bias to exist in favor of incumbent technologies that already have well understood regulatory practices. So whatever we do, we have to make sure that we don't just slap on extra regulation on LEO because orbital debris is in the news right now and because LEO are the new market entrants. Rather, we need a fresh look at the whole sector. Um, and I would note that in, at least in certain types of debris risk, uh, LEO would be considered extraordinarily low risk because of uh, the rapid clearance and, um, and small size of typical LEO satellites. So it's not, I, again, I want to emphasize, I'm not just saying regulate for the sake of regulating. I'm saying we have to take a comprehensive look at the environment and incentive, incentivize good practices as well. So just to, to address this point further, um, we might otherwise say, well, the fact that licensees come to complain to the FCC doesn't prove anything except that the status quo exists and the FCC is the people that they have to talk to. It doesn't prove that that's an optimal pathway for the future. Sure, but I would have two replies to that. One, you regulate with the agencies that you have. If you think things are tough now, imagine standing up, staffing, voting in, establishing precedent for a federal satellite commission. Um, I, I, I'd, rather, I'd rather do it within what we have. And two, the FCC's conventional role as an industry convener is precisely why we're a good choice for handling orbital debris, which is at its base a coordination issue. The notice and comment rulemaking process is tailor-made to address objectively the issues that industry itself has not yet hammered out, and it can be done at the FCC nowhere, as in nowhere else in the market in such a way that we don't stifle innovation by favoring incumbents. We all know about other cases of regulatory capture, including in private standards bodies, but what if the FCC is best positioned to be the honest broker at this time of continued change and development? Lastly, on this point, the FCC always uh, takes a look at industry best, best practices and frequently adopts them as a matter of course. Industry is utterly free to come to the FCC with an orbital debris mitigation scheme amenable to most participants, and it will enjoy fair evaluation and possibly wholesale adoption. Okay, now let's turn to the jurisdiction question. Let's discuss how to make the United States a jurisdiction of first resort for participants in the space economy and to discourage the flight of capital and innovation off our shores. Well, here's the thing, at least as it relates to the present bill, the best thing that we can do for this is to pass the bill. A streamlined application process will inevitably help more than a clear grant of authority to address orbital debris standards hurts. Look, right now when people aren't putting satellites up, it's not because they're worried they're gonna to have to comply with orbital debris standards. It's because processing is so painful. A streamlined process will inevitably um, resolve this problem, which is the prime complaint that we hear from the sector. A lack of staffing, hammering out finer points of processing rounds, managing application modifications that don't matter at all to orbital debris. That's what's holding things up. Well, let's say that we were to sever the orbital debris language from the draft and leave it just as establishing a streamlined process and the application of public interest standards to that process. Well, I would suggest that an enabling statute that requires that we apply public interest to licensee applications for space stations leaves the door open for the FCC to apply its orbital debris standards anyway and in fact might push us to do that. Second, as I just mentioned, we already have orbital debris standards that we apply to licensees. So a mere clarification of the grant of authority to do so and a provided direction for those standards actually increases Congress's uh, interface to us, gives them a direct say in the rules and gives any future failure, failure of those standards a clearer uh, ledger of political accountability. So I think this will soften the rules by comparison and create more democratic accountability and responsiveness than we would otherwise see. So. Um, so it's another argument in favor. And the other thing I want everyone to consider just for a second, is a thoughtfully, uh, is a thoughtfully devised regulatory regime actually anti-business? I would say not. Maybe a clear, certain, meticulously and parametrically defined set of orbital debris standards from a rulemaking body is just what the doctor ordered right now. Go ahead and look at the financial regulatory industry for a second. Um, I'm, a, I'm a dual national. I've, uh, I've been involved in financings in over 20 countries. Uh, the SEC is, uh, you know, is a very sophisticated agency. 
And I'm noting that people from all over the world are investing their money in the United States. And if you don't believe me, um, you should look at land registries in New York City, right? People from all over the world love to park their money in the United States because our financial system is clear, stable, and independent. And this leads to, uh, this leads to confidence for, from an investment perspective. And I'm thinking if we bring the same uh, degree of certainty and confidence, um, including, as I said, incentivizing best practices, then that will encourage the most uh, forward-looking companies with the most advanced technology to consider the advantages of American registration. So uh, to address the final point, the FCC's putative lack of statutory authority to regulate orbital debris. The argument here is simple. Either the FCC lacks regulatory authority over the evaluation of orbital debris mitigation plans for its licensee simpliciter, or it has authority, but that authority is limited to where orbital debris might affect the purposes to which a license or grant of market access is put, that is, radio frequency access to US ground stations. So um, in support of those points, some significance is often ascribed to the materially different conditions of space as opposed to terrestrial operations. Taking these in reverse order, I'm fully unconvinced by the latter argument that our authority is highly constrained. Orbital debris can certainly impact a satellite's access to the US market because it can have an impact on an actual satellite. The obliteration of a satellite seems to me to be a plausible nexus to what that satellite's antenna is doing. But where there's skepticism of the FCC's authority over the question at all, let me address it. First, we've been evaluating orbital debris plans for licensees and market access grantees for well over two decades. If the FCC lacked the authority, Congress was free to say so and stop us. It didn't. And so far, I just see no clear signals from Congress overall that we've, tr that we've pushed our authority too far. Next, while it's of course true that our regulations interact with NOAA and the FAA, and there's concern about overregulation or duplication, such as might render FCC regulatory, regulations nugatory, incompatible, surplusage, nothing could be further from the truth. Observe, for example, that the FCC barely dips a toe into broader concerns of space traffic management or space situational awareness. And indeed, we're quite, quite constrained in the application of our broad Title III public interest authority um, on the, the larger question of space management. At the FCC, we don't tell my applicants how to micromanage their space assets. We just ask that there really be a plan that really gets to the results everyone wants, a good operating environment where all players, including the international ones launching abroad who want US market access, but don't have to listen to the FAA, are nonetheless following our rules. Lastly, some of the arguments relating to the inherent difference of the operating environment of space or the particulars of how orbital debris rules are applied, I also find them wanting. First of all, space isn't really that far away. Uh, we just heard that the edge is 62 miles up. Well, this is Texas, 62 miles, that might be a daily commute for some people. Um, you know, the Carmen line is closer to us than San Antonio is right now. And that's, you know, that's about the same as the length of broadcast contour as the crow flies. I don't think the distance out, uh, argument really applies here. And if orbital debris rules are rules on where space stations can be and how they have to station keep, avoid other stations deorbit, I'll just say that any broadcaster can draw a through line between a construction permit and regulations about safety and operation. I think there'd be fewer complaints about these, frankly, if there was more assurance about responsiveness and support at the FCC level. So that's on us to get right. I'm not saying that the FCC is empowered to do whatever it wants to prevent orbital debris at any cost, but I am saying that we probably are empowered and expected to do something. And we should. Orbital debris is not yet a crisis, but if we fail to act, looking not just at new entrants, but assessing the situation as a whole and taking into account debris plumes that have accumulated in the past, then we can make it a crisis. An opportunity is available for bold American leadership that protects space as an operating environment, not just now, but for the Artemis moon colony in 2024 and for a Mars colony in 2025. New industries are potentially available. Uh, orbital debris detection is still in its early stages. There are lots of small particles out there that can cause devastating impacts that uh, we're tracking is in its infancy. Uh, another opportunity is for cleanup of space debris. Again, there are projects in play in this area, but, we, but um, I would say there's still substantial market opportunity there as well, not to mention the question of who should pay for it and uh, to what extent it's worth doing. And I could also see um, even the idea of satellite management as a service popping up as uh, large constellation managers um, investigate the possibility of incorporating individual satellites from individual independent operators into their constellation management programs so that those operators don't have to reinvent the wheel and can instead simply pay for access to the current management systems that have been de developed at great expense and with great sophistication. So I think there are new industries that could emerge if we get the regulatory aspects right. Um, I think we can also preserve the vitality of our space economy indefinitely. And finally, we can make sure that we really assess all the players 
in the um, in the space sector and ensure that it's not just a matter of stepping on the new guy. So in clarifying the FCC's authority to act and giving clear guidance in the formation of its orbital debris rules, the Satellite and Telecommunications Streamlining Act seizes that opportunity. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thanks very much. One joke and one serious point. Uh, our lights were flickering during your speech, Commissioner, and I've been assured that we have not uh, been hacked by Putin. Uh, thank you for laughing. Uh, and on a serious point, in a, a previous life, uh, about a year ago, I served as the Vice Chairman of the Administrative Rules Review Committee of the Iowa Senate. So state rulemaking, a little bit different than federal rulemaking, but uh, as a former member of that committee, I appreciate your thoughtful approach to a statutory uh, authority and, uh, and your rulemaking authority. So thank you for, for speaking to us on that. I would uh, now like to introduce uh, Professor Adam Kandu. Adam Kandub is Professor of Law and Director of the Intellectual Property, Information and Communications Law Program at the Michigan State University College of Law. Professor Kandub has had a distinguished legal career, serving as a law clerk to a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, an advisor at the FCC, an attorney at prominent law firms, and in 2004, he joined the law school faculty. And Professor Kandub, if we have one thing in common, it was that I also served as article editor of my law review. Uh, from his faculty bio, Professor Kandub's scholarly interests focus on the law and regulation of communications, internet, and technology. He joined the Trump administration in 2019 as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Telecommunications and Information, and he assumed the role of Acting Assistant Secretary. He later joined the Department of Justice as Deputy Associate Attorney General. Professor Kandub is also a senior fellow at the DC-based Center of Renewing America. Please help me in welcoming Professor Adam Kandub. Uh, so the phrase disruptive internet technology has become a bit of a cliche, uh, but certainly one technology in particular, I would say social media, uh, has been disruptive of something of significance to most people in this room. Uh, namely, I think social media has been disruptive of a lot of Republicans and conservatives' ideological priors uh, when it comes to regulation. Uh, I always, I one time always believed more strictly than I do now, but I'm still mostly believe that market solutions are the best solutions. It's best for individuals to make small decisions in the marketplace for the most efficient distribution of goods. However, uh, recent events, I, I think, have made it inarguable that the large uh, internet platforms are not acting as simple wealth maximizers that we all learned about in Econ 101, but rather have taken a political slant, a political motivation, um, and, and, and you're furthering an ideology which is at odds which, with what a lot of conservatives and Republicans uh, believe. Uh, and I, I would point, you know, evidence for the prosecution, if anyone doubts that, um, the suppression of the Hunter Biden stories at a pivotal moment in the 2020 election, um, the continued um, censorship of, of legitimate scientific inquiry about public policy responses to the COVID epidemic. Um, and it continues in a variety of different ways that are less noticeable in the news. So for instance, um, we just learned that anyone who questions the climate, uh, the climate change consensus is now spreading disinformation. So on a variety of different levels, um, it appears as if many of the platforms are acting in ways um, that aren't consistent with what we'd expect from you know, regular wealth maximizing entities um, and are behaving in ways that actually could threaten something perhaps even more important, which are democratic institutions of free speech uh, and the potential um, for uh, impartial government um, that, that we really need to preserve those markets and to make sure that we have fair decision making. Um, 
so that has led me, uh, and uh, I think many other Republicans, um, to the belief that yes, um, something must be done to um, respond to the power of this large um, internet platforms, in particular the social media firms. Um, I, I would say just as a side note, I, I think the hypocrisy is much worse on the left. Um, you know, if you read John Stewart on the liberal left, or if you read John Stewart, Lib, uh, John Stewart Mill, he's much harder, he's as hard on private censorship as he is on government censorship, but that's forgotten now by the left. They're fine with um, Facebook and uh, um, Google censoring the um, uh, people on our side. So um, I, I think as far as you know, intellectual inconsistency, I'm, we're not really there. I think we're, it's, we're fighting to try to preserve the institution of free speech in a, a medium which does not seem particularly respectful of it. So what are some of the approaches that we can do? Well, I think there are four I'll touch briefly on today. Um, one, innovation. Two, removing some of the privileges that the uh, big platforms uh, enjoy, uh, largely because of historical accident, but most notably under Section 230. Uh, the possibility of antitrust, new legislation, or existing enforcement. And finally, um, the uh, wagon to which I'm you know, hitching my star, which is um, state laws to um, prohibit discrimination by social media firms. And in particular, um, the one passed by the state of Texas, currently uh, under appeal before the Fifth Circuit, which I think offers a model to the nation and which I, you know, I hope and pray the, the Fifth Circuit will uphold. So let's start with the first response, innovation. And of course, we hear it all the time. You know, you don't like the way what, the way Facebook edits your posts. You don't like what Google does to your search rankings. Build your own Google. And of course, the, the implicit little assumption is that you know Google isn't there because of accents or government preferences. Um, it's because you know the left is smarter, and you, you know, silly, not so bright right wingers. You know, you can't possibly do it. Well, you know, certainly Parler tried. Um, in January 2021, it was the most downloaded app in the world, and it was being downloaded at an incredible um, uh, rate, one that was actually threatening to many of the platforms. But magically, what happened when there seemed to be an opposing ideological company? Well, Amazon, um, at the behest of um, uh, certain Democratic politicians, it appears, you know, of course, uh, as we all know, um, the, the web services um, took the, took the um, parlor servers away, um, essentially threw them offline, um, really uh, destroying the momentum for that, co that company, which is now, even now trying to recover. Um, and that this, um, you know, further links to Parler were, were blocked from the major social media companies. So if we're serious as, you know, Republicans as conservatives as creating an alternative, we have a problem. Uh, there is an entrenched network effect that is going to be working against us. Okay, so let's talk about removing some of their privileges. Certainly Section 230, which was designed for the dial-up internet, which uh, when you had a you know, telephone and, and you had to use their modem and match the protocols, and as I tell my students, it was used in, 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 in Western civilization about you know, a few years after we stopped um, putting cuneiform lettering into uh, clay tablets. Um, I usually get a joke on this. It's a very, very hard, tough crowd. Um, so uh, the uh, so it was really designed for a, a world in which there were wall gardens, and and um, the the idea was that to encourage more conversation, to encourage more um, d diversity and free speech, we would limit the liability of the platform, so they wouldn't be liable for every comment that was made on their bulletin boards. However, what it has become is it has become a legal shield for the platforms to impose their censorship regimes. And so they can't be challenged under anti-discrimination laws, they can't be challenged under consumer fraud laws, they can't be challenged under contract. Um, so if we're interested in free speech, these have to be pushed back. Um, I One way is the courts to try to get rid of some of these entrenched rulings. Um, I was once involved in a, a, a case doing that, one of the few, I think the only one to ever win at any level on a, on a sort of free speech grounds. And when we did, um, essentially all of Silicon Valley marshaled its, its, its troops. It's, uh, uh, and uh, we were, 
we had as interveners Facebook, Google, Twitter, and every, you know, three internet associations. And of course, it was reversed on this extraordinary um, procedural reaction. Um, and I didn't, we didn't even have a chance to argue before a judge. Um, the response was so sudden, so quick. And that has been our experience um, uh, in other situations too. We're very much outgunned um, from a litigation perspective. So of course there are there's reform, reform in Congress. So there's been a lot of very good statutory reform. Um, in particular, um, I think Senator Haggerty from Tennessee has done a great job. Uh, but given the current political constellation, it's unlikely whether any of these nice reforms will ever get passed. They're they're still very much in the idea stage. Okay, so that leads us to antitrust. Again, um, uh, the Justice Department under President Trump did file a landmark suit against Google, um, and it's languishing, uh, as all the, the you know, several other um, uh, court um, uh, uh, antitrust actions um, against Google. Um, they've, they've gotten a lot of setbacks. Um, this has to do, I think, complex reasons about antitrust law, which makes it particularly difficult to um, win these suits um, against the platforms due to the nature of, of, of the markets that they, they dominate in. Um, so that leads to some type of reform. And actually, there's been a lot of movement on the Hill introducing um, several uh, interesting bipartisan antitrust reform bills. Um, however, uh, it, you know, the, the phrase is, you know, beware Greeks bearing gifts, and I think the same thing could be said about um, Senator Amy Klobuchar. Um, many of these bills come with strings that may not be too friendly toward um, conservative free speech, um, and we have to be very, very careful about that. Um, and so they may increase um, the potential for antitrust liability, but they often will end up as a result giving these platforms even greater power to censor. And so there we are with antitrust. It's unlikely that the um, Biden administration will bring any huge, useful antitrust lawsuit. And it's un once again, it's unlikely that um, Congress will come up with any great idea um, given the current political constellation. So what's left? Well, uh, all eyes turn to Texas. Uh, the states have been remarkably active in passing anti-viewpoint discrimination statutes. So what does this mean? Well, for centuries, um, certain basic industries and technologies, ranging from the stagecoach and the railroad to the telephone and the telegraph, were under the obligation to serve all customers without discrimination. Just a basic rule of, uh, uh, of American industrial structure that some it, it was considered and, and perhaps correctly so, I believe so, um, that there's just certain industries where there, where consumers should not be at the, mer the arbitrary mercy or whim of the provider, and they have a, a, a right to use their services without discrimination. Um, and to this day, telephones, um, local telephone service is still regulated in the same way. Air, airlines are, FedEx deliveries are, you know, FedEx can't deliver, can, can't refuse to deliver you because you're Episcopalian or because you're Jewish or because you're black. You, you have a right to get on an airplane regardless of your political point of view. And what these statutes do is the same thing holds for social media. They can't discriminate in the uh, viewpoint discriminate or discriminate on the basis of, of, your, of your political or social views um, in the provision of social media services. So the first state to pass a similar type of law was Florida. This was a little different. It wasn't a sort of common carrier law that protected citizens. It was more of a protection of um, uh, political candidates uh, and journalists, oddly enough, um, and that was challenged in the 11th. It was it was thrown out by a um, Democratic appointed district judge and is now now before the 11th Circuit. Um, I think a far better model was Texas's model, um, which is a common carrier approach and simply says social media companies, you can't discriminate on the basis of viewpoint. That means you can't, in your deplatforming decisions, in your promotion of content, you can't treat people who are essentially similarly situated but only differ because of their political beliefs in blatantly discriminatory ways. And 
Um, it was, uh, of course, challenged by a phalanx of uh, leading lights in in the big tech industry, and um, we had the bet. Or I, I don't know if I should say this. We had the luck of getting Judge Pittman, um, who was not particularly, you know, again another Democratic appointee who was not particularly friendly toward the bill, um, the law, I should say. Um, however, that too is currently under appeal to the Fifth Circuit. So that's sort of the the state of the play when it comes to um, sort of conservative Republican reaction to big tech. Um, you know, I'm delighted to answer questions. Um, again, I think it's it's a really sort of turning point, um, not just from a policy perspective, but also from a ideological or sort of values perspective. Um, I, I think if we're going to go down this route, uh, we have to recognize um, that in a small minority of situations, the market may not have the right answer. Um, and that there are certain institutions like free speech, um, like the full participation of all citizens in, in political discussion um, that requires to take a, a closer look. So delighted to answer any questions. Thank you so much. All right. We will uh, thank you both for sharing your thoughts with us. We'll go to uh, audience Q&A. And uh, we have uh, at least at one staff member with a microphone. Uh, I will uh, call on people. And if you could just wait until he arrives with the microphone. Uh, first hand up was uh, the gentleman over there. Uh, please wait until uh, he gets there with the microphone just so our friends watching in digital world can hear. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming today. Uh, my question is to, uh, Dr. Kind of, in I believe Section 230 was passed in 1998. Um, why is it that we have legislators that really can't think ahead and didn't put in the language that you can't censor uh, speeds? Why did they Why did they leave that out? Uh, was that deliberate? You would think they would be smart enough to figure that out. Uh, and then to go to your other point, which was that if you have, you know. Um, it kind of goes to, to me, it seems like the same thing as, you know, the, the baker that doesn't want to bake a cake for the gay wedding, should they be forced to bake a cake? Should a private company be forced to allow uh, messages or speech that they don't want on their platforms? Um, they seem to be kind of the same thing. Okay, good. Well, I'm a law professor, so you'll forgive Forgive me if I'm a little, if I might come a little, seem a little pedantic in my response. So as long as you, men with best, <laughs> in, in good faith and kind intentions. Um, it wasn't 1998, it was 1996. And I think that's important um, because the World Wide Web was just being introduced. Now when we passed in 1996, it was actually February of 1996. And most of the bill had been lobbied for two years before, starting in 1994. And if you, anyone recalls, and as I joked about my students in the Cuneo forum, nobody seemed, and my students weren't even alive then now, but it's hard to remember. When you went to AOL, you had this walled garden. You, you couldn't just go anywhere. You were given bulletin boards or stock checks. Uh, you know, and, and, and so when two, Section 230 was passed and said, look, you won't be liable for all the comments there, we thought that would be a good thing. It would lead to more comments because and more openness because there'd be no incentive um, uh, to um, the, 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 there would be uh, no liability and they would have the incentive to open up. Uh, what they did not foresee for better or for worse is of course social media with the power to curate everything and um, they didn't foresee that courts would rule very strangely the section 230 actually protects these censorship decisions which um, was a, I would consider an over, overstep by the judiciary. So, you know, I don't defend Congress that often, um, but it was understandable. And I, I mean, I think if, if, if you want to blame somebody, it, it would be judges for essentially saying, look, let's expand this immunity of liability. It makes our lives easier. We get to dismiss suits more quickly. I forget the cynicism, but I think we're a little bit there. Second, um, this is certainly not, um, uh, what is it, masterpiece, um, cake shop. 
an actual distinction, and I said sounding a little professorial, that really goes back to almost the 15th and 16th century. Um, the idea is that there are certain goods that are offered to the public without bargaining or under accepted and understood conditions. Um, they were called common callings in the in the 16th and century, 16th and 17th century. And the idea is, if you are, if you go um, to a um, if you go to the telephone company, they're offering you a service. You don't get to haggle. You don't have a specific agreement about it. You don't have a special contract. It's not a one. It's a one size fits all. And in situations where there are one size fits all, um, we generally accept non discrimination requirements. So. Lunch counters can't discriminate on the basis of race. Um, we can't, um, uh, the, you can't be barred from retail establishments because of, of your religion. You can't be barred from public accommodations like, you know, hotels. Uh, that's because it's just this one, one, it's a one size fit all offer. It's offered to generally, generally to the public. In contrast, I think the line that the Supreme Court will have to draw, and, and they just took the case in that in, in uh, the uh, the web design case, is when you have a specialty agreement, a specialty product that is sort of custom made for the customer, requiring special types of negotiation and agreement, and where it actually requires the business to express the message of the customer. That's a different situation, and that's the limit of these common carrier and public. So I'm sorry, it was a little bit long. I, 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 I uh, it's, um, and we'll go to the gentleman in the, the front row and then the gentleman behind him. Uh, yes, sir. This is for uh, Commissioner Symington. Allow me. Forgive me if I need to set the table just very briefly here. I'm a retired NASA and retired Air Force officer working in uh, space communications. And one of the things at the root of how NASA was established was when we started going to space, we had ground communications to our, our spacecraft. And as technologies emerged, we got TDRA satellites so that we'd get more robust coverage around the globe. And then ultimately, the communication satellites that are geostationary were there and we could communicate with the station or the shuttle 24-7 anytime we wanted to. But in doing that, NASA never went back to or abandoned the ground stations as a core capability. What we are seeing now is an abandonment of what we had on the ground for what we have in space. And I'm wondering if from a regulatory standpoint, we might be able to do more to strike that balance between what we're doing in space alone versus what we're augmenting from the ground. I just have this vision of an EMP blast at geostationary orbit, and suddenly we don't have GPS, we don't have Amazon, God forbid, and uh, it's all gone. And, you know, we used to just, you know, strategically and tactically, you know, uh, route military aircraft from the ground. We rely on satellites now, and I'm wondering if regulata regulatory um, pressures are working for or against us there. Uh, thank you. So uh, interesting, interesting suite of, of questions there. So, um, so uh, there's, there's been a, a lot of liberalization recently uh, as regard, uh, as regard eSIMs, um, or stations in motion. So um, mobile, uh, mobile terrestrial stations. Um, with uh, with modern eSIMs being much more sophisticated in in beam forming solid uh, solid state components power consumption etc so there's been a huge liberalization in that area um as far as uh as far as um uh, teleports or uh, other major ground installations i think we're i think we're seeing a degree of liberalization there too although um itu moves in that area aren't my area of specific expertise um as far as uh as far as threats to the satellite space, um, whether that's from inadequate protection of ground stations or vulnerability of satellites to EMP, um, it's it's definitely something that we have to think about because the proliferation in this sector has let, has therefore created new threat surfaces that didn't exist prior. And I don't know if there's uh, maybe like a, a more specific question that you'd like to bring about ground, ground stations uh, specifically or 
if, if there's if there's a particular regulatory question you'd like me to address, but um, just generally, um, generally we need to continue continue ensuring that rules like the eSIM rules that regard ground stations are up to date with current technical capacities and aren't burdened with uh, with requirements that date back to inferior technical capacities prior. And I would say the same applies throughout the entire satellite sector, and we should you know, be actively incentivizing through regulation, modernization, and adoption of newer, less, uh, in some cases, lower impact technologies in those areas, um, rather than being bound uh, by restrictions on what ground stations and satellites could do 30, 40 years ago. Thank you. Andy, and then uh, the gentleman there in the middle is on deck. Thank you. Professor, we uh, testified in support of the social media bill in Texas, HB 20, particularly the notion that the social media guys are common carriers and should be treated, regulated as such. I think Texas is the first state to have language there. And also the notion that you and I should have private cause of action if our uh, materials are deleted. Do uh, you have any comments on that? Well, uh, as, I, as I said in my talk, uh, I think that the Texas approach is certainly the best that has been yet adopted. I think Florida definitely gets credit for being the first, but um, Texas adaptation of the common carrier model, I think is, is effective. It's, it's legally defensible, um, provided the FCC um, and its network neutrality order <laughs> has proper preemption issues, uh, if you ever have one, and I hope it's a, it's a big F. Um, but uh, and and that it, it's consistent with you know centuries of uh, Anglo American law. Um, the private court of a action I think is really important. Um, many of these state laws say, oh, we'll have the, you know our our, our state you know, um, consumer protection agency do it, or have you know, the thoughts of having the FCC take care of it. I mean, I've, Yes, the gentleman does a great job, but I'm a defender of, uh, of private causes of action. I think that it's a way of equalizing the tremendous power of big tech as far as their lawyers um, and their ability to get the outcomes they want in DC with agencies. The gentleman in the middle, I'm sorry, I just couldn't see your name tag. Otherwise, I would have called you by your name. <laughs> well, hi, Professor. Yeah, my name is Noel Opperman. I like to focus on the innovation piece. The reason why Parler failed is because it still relies on centralized infrastructure, namely AWS, as you pointed out. And so I'm the founder of HeyTX, which is the custodian of the .tx blockchain domain. And so .tx is based on a decentralized naming protocol called Handshake. And Handshake allows for anyone to own censorship resistant names on the internet. And so I'd love to gather your thoughts instead of solely focusing on regulating big tech, how about states you know can promote or encourage decentralized technologies to empower internet users to control their online experience thank you well i'm very supportive and i think that um, states can do a tremendous um, service in pushing newer technologies i'm not familiar with exactly the way it works but i know the, uh, you will get the technology that you describe um, but of course i've i've heard um similar proposals, I think very supportive. I mean, people don't realize that in a way, um, internet architecture is strangely authoritarian in that there are certain groups that publish lists of names, called domain names, and everyone has to follow the same protocol um, or you can be cut off. And what that really means is that there are nodes of weakness that can be, the government can use to pressure to crush people. Um, and you know, you saw it actually in just the Ukraine. Ukraine went to ICANN ICAN and said, "Oh, could you please cut off all the Russia domain names?" So essentially, cutting Russia off from the internet. So I think what you're proposing, and I, I wish you great luck to it, is, is exactly what we need: is sort of resilient internet, resilient from government influence as well. And states can do a lot. I mean, it, it sounds crazy, it sounds gutsy, but you know, for instance, cryptocurrency. There's a movement to um, to have government, uh, state governments, use cryptocurrency in a lot of their transactions. That sort of bold move, um, which I think could really help individuals have regained power and control over their, their, their economic lives. Great question. I think we have time for one more before we wrap up. I'll go to the gentleman in the back just to, just to give everybody one swipe. Hi, my name is Christian. A uh, quick question for the commissioner. Could you talk about the unique problems posed by CubeSats and how their proliferation is kind of clogging up the space? 
Sure. Um, so, so the the CubeSat industry is um, is uh, from one perspective is, is a democratization of space capabilities. I mean, there are there are companies there that can um, that can use other companies' launch capabilities to put a CubeSat up cheaply. And I've in fact seen schematics to build a CubeSat of your own from generic parts for about five thousand dollars. So. Uh, if you want to talk, talk about uh, uh, democratizing access to technology, that's certainly one way. Um, but at, it, but at the same time, yes, we do have to act. Uh, we do have to ask about its impact on orbit, particularly uh, low Earth orbit uh, satellites. Now, you you'll remember perhaps that at the end of my remarks, I talked about one potentially emergent new industry, and that would be traffic um, space traffic management as a service, because. Uh, it's one thing to put a satellite up, and it's another thing to be responsible through that satellite through its entire life cycle, including deorbiting. And um, and we want to make sure that we aren't uh, that 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 we're incentivizing active constellation management to the to the degree that that's the right approach or other responsible approaches um, in low Earth orbit. Now, my own view is that the carrying cap capacity of low Earth orbit is very substantial, um, even with even with unmanaged constellations, um, I've seen research indicating that the the total LEO carrying capacity is between 130 and, and about 2 million satellites. So we're not close to those numbers yet, even with the larger constellations going up. But nonetheless, um, nonetheless, we don't want to be sloppy about it either. And we don't want to put satellites up that are poorly enough made that they will generate debris that is not that is not recognized at the time. And with our tracking capabilities generally tapping out around 10 centimeters right now, um, that's you know that's a real threat. Even you know even a screw or a loose strut or something like that can be very damaging. So, but at the same time, we want companies that are sophisticated, for example, in imaging technology without necessarily being sophisticated in satellite operations technology to have a way to get into the market. So I think one possible path forward is for companies that have advanced traffic management systems already to partner with specialist companies in other areas to incorporate their satellites into managed constellations. Uh, that's. Uh, I'm obviously, uh, you know, I'm sure the market will think of things that I haven't thought of in this respect. But um, as we, but as we continue to incentivize good practices, it becomes uneconomical to engage in bad practices. So, for example, and I'm just spitballing here. Please, no one take this seriously as a regulatory proposal. But one possibility would be that the better your traffic constellation management is, the more you can haircut your insurance or other uh, financial responsibility requirements. The other side of that is that if, if, you're an, if you're an efficient manager, then you're market advantaged against inefficient managers who just wanna throw something up there for the cost of launch. And perhaps if someone never has a hope of becoming an efficient manager themselves, they buy into your constellation or, um, or else they have to pay for it in insurance or bonding or some other means. When you can imagine a lot of responses, a lot of possibilities going forward. My sense is that the companies that need to, to manage their constellations well have already put a huge amount of effort into doing that. And we wanna make sure that they're appropriately recognized for those efforts and that they're, they're not put into the same pool as companies that have not made those efforts. And the other side of it is we also want there to be a path for new entrant, entrants. So I think there's room for a lot of thinking on this uh, approach. Well, I would just like to uh, thank the audience here in attendance and those watching on the live stream, all of our uh, friends on our events team, our comms team, our intern as our timekeeper. Thank you all for your help. Uh, Commissioner Symington, Professor Candube, thank you for your time and willingness to engage with our audience and for your distinguished service to our nation and your efforts to safeguard our technology infrastructure and way of life. I'm very excited about TPPF taking a leading role in advancing sound state-based uh, policy uh, and solutions. And part of that is a regulatory environment that allows industry to innovate and grow in the blockchain space, automation, and, and, and other spaces. So thank you for your question on that. I would, uh, we'll close with that. And I just uh, ask everybody to join me in thanking Commissioner Symington and Professor Candy. Thank you.